Good start. So hello everybody and welcome and thanks for joining us, giving us your time today. My name is Tamsa Nobirden. I'm an editorial director for social science at Springer Nature. Um, thanks for joining us and welcome to this partnered event between the Sustainable Development Solutions Network and Springer Nature. So the COVID pandemic has shown us that the world can act with urgency to tackle the biggest crises. It's demonstrated that the focus and coordinated efforts of global experts can lead to radical changes in global mobility, economies and entirely new vaccines. It has also highlighted the crucial importance of tackling misinformation and motivated ignorance encouraging individual behaviours that benefit society collectively and showing how structural inequalities dictate who is most affected. All issues with clear parallels to the climate crisis. So how can these lessons from COVID-19 inform climate action? And this is why we're meeting today. On considering the convening potential of our two organisations to create a contribution to COP26, we put together this series of roundtables to examine these connections between COVID and climate to see if there are lessons that we can learn. But the roundtables were not the usual group of experts. Today's meeting brings together chairs from two roundtables of invited cross-sectoral experts from across natural, applied and social science disciplines, who we asked to explore how interdisciplinary, diverse and cross-sectoral connection and collaboration can increase our ability to succeed in meeting climate goals. This format that we've devised, that of arranging groups of people in this way, um, that were proactively engineered to ensure different disciplines, people and sectors meet and talk is quite a unique and ambitious attempt to facilitate collaboration, discussion and connection. Um, so thanks again for coming. The first thing we'd like to do um, is have our keynote speakers um, introduce the meeting as well. Um, but I'd first like to introduce my colleague and co-moderator, Aaron Kuster. Hello, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning. My name is Arvind Küster. I'm Director of Academic Affairs at Springer Nature here in Berlin, and part of the team which has initiated this series of roundtable you're gonna hear more of today. Thanks again for joining us today. The event started back around, I would say, May and June 2020, quite a long time ago, when a small group within Springer Nature came together to start thinking about how we could convene different disciplines to find common learnings from the COVID crisis. At that stage, if you look back, we were still mostly under lockdowns, had to adapt our working patterns, change the way we socialized, learned and interacted. Inequalities in societies, whether from a global or social background and angle became starkly visible. From a very personal perspective, I tried to adapt to living and working in Berlin. I only had moved from China at the end of December. In fact, my Chinese friends urged me to buy masks as early as mid-January. A common theme which we looked at was open research, preprints, fast dissemination, and so on, at least from a publisher's more functional perspective. However, the achievement of rapidly sharing itself also became politicized and weaponized with misinformation, miscommunication, rapidly changing public reactions wherever we were. Together now with the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, and thank you for joining forces with us, we also wanted to explore a very new format with those roundtables and convene them at the intersection of humanity, social sciences, and science. In Germany, we would call this Wissenschaft. One roundtable to look at was the theme of behavior and the other one on inequalities. Throughout the planning, we also wanted to maintain our desire to leave the outcome completely open. We will hear today summaries from both tables and please free to add questions in the Q&A below. But first, let me introduce Magdalena Skipper, Editor-in-Chief of Nature. Magdalena holds a PhD in Development Genetics from the University of Cambridge. She joined Nature Reviews Genetics in 2001 as a Chief Editor and has taken several roles at the Nature Partner Journals and Nature Communications. She became the first female Editor-in-Chief of the journal Nature in 2018. Welcome Magdalena, over to you. Thank you, thank you very much for the invitation and for this very kind introduction. It is indeed a, a great pleasure to be opening this session on the lessons that can be learned from uh, crises like COVID-19 and the climate emergency. Crises are well known for focusing the mind and we have certainly seen that the current pandemic has done 
just that. The pandemic unfolds with great speed in a highly interconnected world. And so its devastating effects can be seen pretty much immediately. By contrast, climate emergency has been unfolding for decades now. And despite that knowledge, we have chosen not to act swiftly enough. Speed is of the essence when faced with a crisis. And we've had ample opportunities in the past to see that acting quickly is paramount if uh, lives are to be saved. Back in 2002, for example, when the SARS pandemic first started, it took several months for information and data to be shared so that WHO and the world could get a true picture of the issue and set out appropriate recommendations. In the case of COVID-19, the news and data spread much faster, but not fast enough, nor was there sufficient transparency around the early disease spread to prevent or stymie the spread of the virus across Asia to Europe and beyond. Fortunately, however, the fundamental data about the virus were shared early on within the research community. And it is thanks to this sharing that we have highly effective vaccines today, the impressively rapid development of which we continue to celebrate and rightly so. This is a lesson we must take on board that in the face of a global emergency, data and information must be shared transparently across the world. Also instrumental to successful vaccine development were partnerships between private and public sectors enabled by appropriate financial support. Another crucial contributor to the success, of course, were cross-discipline collaborations. While we have the biomedical advances to thank for vaccine development, we have needed the expertise of social sciences to deal with vaccine hesitancy, for example. And it was the collaboration between social scientists and epidemiologists that has led to models of social restrictions implemented in their various forms across the globe. We will hear more about uh, motivating behavior change and structural inequalities in the summary from one of the roundtable discussions that took place last week. Both cross-sector and cross-discipline global collaborations that have served us so well in the context of COVID-19 are also necessary to tackle climate emergency. The pandemic and the climate emergency are both global crises. This may seem like an unnecessarily obvious statement, and yet in both cases, world leaders continue to predominantly think and act locally, protecting short-term national interests. Take the G20 summit, which just ended, at which the G20 leaders pledged to stop the overseas financing of coal plants, but remained silent about their own domestic production and use of coal. No one is safe until everyone is safe. We've heard this repeatedly during the ongoing pandemic. We should remember that the same applies to the devastating effects of climate change. As much as we are right to celebrate the vaccine success, we know all too well that not everyone has benefited from them. Repeated calls for efficient distribution of vaccines across the globe, for patent waivers and capacity sharing um, have so far gone largely unanswered, with only a few percent of the population in the global south being vaccinated. At the same time, people like me are about to receive their booster. The climate crisis parallel is the wealthy nation's reluctance to finance climate solutions in the poorer nations. These nations, we all agree, bear the brunt of climate change, having contributed to the current situation the least. And the figures are clear. 
wealthy nations have failed to fulfill their promise to deliver on the $100 billion pledge to support poorer nations. And where the finance is being considered and offered, it is predominantly done so as a loan to be repaid with interest, not as grants. Now, this is very short-sighted thinking. If we are to tackle global challenges like the climate crisis, like the current pandemic, solutions need to be equitable. The second of the uh, last week's roundtable panel discussions focused on structural inequalities, and we will shortly hear more on this topic. Crises such as COVID-19 or the climate emergency clearly know no borders. We should therefore focus on working together across silos, sharing information, data, technology, and expertise to find global solutions and support one another so that these solutions can be effectively implemented locally everywhere. Global interests must come first. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the rest of our session. Thank you very much, Magdalena, and I'm pleased to say that Magdalena will join us back for the panelist discussion towards the end of the session. Thank you. Our second keynote then is from Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Jeffrey D. Sachs is a professor, author, and advisor to governments around the world and to the United Nations. He is a university professor and director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University and president of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. He is a strong supporter of the Green New Deal and Medicare for All. He is an expert on health, public health and epidemics and has advised the World Health Organization at the highest levels during the past 20 years. Hello, I'm Jeffrey Sachs, university professor at Columbia University and president of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network. I am so grateful to Springer Nature and to Editor-in-Chief Magdalena Skipper for co-hosting with SDSN the important series on learning from crisis, from COVID to climate. And I'm delighted that uh, on the eve of COP26, when the world needs to make critical breakthroughs to a new direction to sustainable development, we'll be working together to learn from the past and uh, use our best knowledge on the way forward. I'm sure that I speak for many people when I say that uh, each Friday uh, for me, when uh, the weekly issue of Nature arrives, uh, it opens up new worlds of insight, uh, scientific discovery, and technological progress. It shows us how we can learn, how fast we can move forward in the direction that we need when we put the best minds together uh, on a basis of shared principles of the common good. That is the purpose uh, of our work together. Uh, we will be exploring the challenges of inequality, uh, race and gender, uh, how to uh, close divisions in our society. We will also be looking at the questions of the most uh, effective ways to promote uh, behavior change for climate change so that we have a safe world. I want to give special thanks to all of my colleagues uh, who have uh, worked so hard to put this effort together, Helen Bond of Howard University, uh, Gerald Torres of Yale Law School, Wolfgang Blau of the Reuters Institute, and Jiang Zhao of the University of British Columbia. Thank you so much for your wonderful work to uh, Springer Nature. Thank you for your wondrous contributions to the world and for this partnership to colleagues at SDSN, a network of more than 1,500 universities and think tanks around the world committed to promoting the sustainable development goals and the achievement of the aims of the Paris Climate Agreement. Let me thank you for all your efforts. 
all best wishes to you, all gratitude, and all best wishes to the participants in this exciting joint venture. Let's learn from crises. Let's find the way forward to sustainable development and the future we want for all. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind words. And um, with this, we are going to dive straight into the two report from the first round table, motivating behavior change and addressing misinformation. I'd like to welcome Professor Zhao and Wolfgang Bau. Please turn on your cameras now. So let me introduce Jai Ying Zhao first. Um, she is Associate Professor and Canada Research Chair at the University of British Columbia and graduated from Princeton in 2013 and is now an Associate Professor within the Department of Psychology at the Institute for Resources at UBC and the Canada Research Chair in Behavior Sustainability at UBC. She also is a faculty affiliate at the Center for Effective Global Action at the University of California, Berkeley, and a member of Canada's Financial Literacy Research Subcommittee. Her research aims to use psychological principles to design behavioral solutions to address financial and environmental sustainability changes. Great, we have you here today. Our second chair is Wolfgang Blau. He is currently a visiting research fellow at the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism and is focusing how on increasing journalism's capacity to cover climate change worldwide this year. But the Reuters Institute has just designed and co-founded the Oxford Climate Journalism Network together with Oxford University. He is the former president, international and chief operating officer at Condé Nast. Previously, he served as the executive director of digital strategy at The Garden and is an editor-in-chief of Site Online. So, Welcome both. Thank you. You could find the time today and participate so actively in our round tables. In these discussions, we convened representatives from journalism, psychology, media studies, environmental science, and management and historians. So we had really lively discussions. So let's start with one of the questions we asked and to report back, probably starting with you, Professor Zhao, and then going over to Wolfgang Blau. What do you think are the similarities and differences between our responders to a COVID-19 crisis and the climate crisis? Jack. Thanks, Aaron. Um, so Wolfgang and I had the fortune to talk to six experts in climate science, communication, psychology, philosophy, um, to discuss this precise question. Um, so the similarities between COVID and, and climate change are that both are global scale problems but the threats are experienced locally by the individuals themselves. And both problems need to be overcome globally. So that there's, there's kind of a local global uh, differentiation for both uh, threats, but both need global solutions. Now there are many differences between COVID and the climate crisis. Uh, first of all, there's a vast difference in how governments responded to both. So for instance, for COVID, there was immediate and massive government response to address the COVID uh, pandemic, but we have yet seen such coordinated, immediate, massive government response to the climate emergency. Uh, there's also differences in, in agency. So for COVID, there are a set of clear individual actions to take, such as you know, getting the vaccine, wear masks, wash our hands, social distancing, for instance but we don't have such guidelines for individual actions for climate yet. And also world leaders publicly demonstrate their actions to address COVID, but they have yet taken those personal uh, individual actions to address climate change. There are differences in threats. So for instance, for COVID, there are immediate personal health threats uh, for individuals around the world, but for climate change, the threats are experienced only to localized populations, not certainly not to everyone at this point. Um, there are differences in risk perception. For instance, COVID is, is, is triggered by one pathogen that are identifiable. There are, there are now there are more uh, variants around the world. Um, so that the causes are identifiable, uh, very clear for COVID, but for climate, all we know is human activities contribute to climate change, but it's unclear what specific activities relevant to the individual is contributing to climate crisis. And finally, there's a difference in disruptions. So there's a working assumption with COVID that, oh, after the pandemic, after we become immune to the disease, we'll go back to normal, life will return to normal. 
but there's no return to normal for the climate emergency. We cannot expect climate change to go away <laughs> magically. There's no immunity to climate change. Um, so we need to understand that there's no you know, return to normal assumption for climate. And in fact, if we don't act fast and now climate change will get worse um, and we need to actually shift our normal and to adapt and to mitigate fast. So these are the, the kind of the, the similarities and differences in the behavioral response to COVID and climate change. Wolfgang, over to you. What do you think are the main differences from your perspective? We look back at the tables. From a journalistic, thank you. Thank you, first of all, and hello, everyone. From a journalistic perspective, the commercial interest in spreading climate misinformation is probably but larger by an order of magnitude than a commercial interest in spreading uh, false information about COVID or lobbying against uh, uh, getting vaccinated. And that has to do with the fact that the, 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 the budgets of entire nations, so-called petrostates and of some of the world's largest corporations uh, are affected by a transition towards renewable energy. For journalists and newsroom managers, the, the, the so-called trolls that attack journalists may sound similar. And of course, there's an ideological overlap between the denial of climate science and the denial of COVID. But the, 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 the funding and the patience of online trolls against climate journalism uh, is, is much, much larger. Um, a wonderful parallel, though, where I think journalism has benefited from COVID journalism is that this was the first time that what you could describe as a science story, that a science story of COVID has dominated the news for more than a year. And uh, in my own research, I have spoken with many newsroom managers around the world that often told me that the science team is now much more integrated in a newsroom. And that is a prerequisite also for better uh, climate journalism. One of our panelists, uh, Professor David Holmes from Monash University also said, the theme of flattening the curve is very similar. We have already learned the concept of flattening the curve that what you, what you don't do now will become more costly later. And that applies to fighting COVID as much as it applies to fighting uh, climate change. The public has also learned and newsrooms have learned to work with data a lot more and to look at charts of vaccination rates and hospitalization rates and other metrics every day. And those data sets are still largely missing in journalism, although some news organizations are now beginning to develop their climate dashboards and show them more regularly. Thank you. Um, <laughs> there's so much to talk about here, yeah, but I mean, when we go back, uh, Jay-Z, uh, your work focuses on behavioral solutions. When you look at your work and the roundtable discussions we had, what do you, where do you think are the most effective interventions where we could encourage collective behavior change to change or to reduce climate emissions? So the most effective intervention is to use a social diffusion approach. So by that, I mean, no single intervention works for everyone. We have to recognize the variety or diversity in, the, in a given population. So in any given population, there are different segments who have different values and different motivations and barriers for action. So what we can do is we can design these targeted interventions for these different interventions. Um, I'm sorry about the siren. I live in downtown Vancouver, so it's kind of noisy, but I, I hope you can hear me okay. So in this social diffusion project, I think this is what a common theme in our discussion for this question is, what are the segments in the population? So the first segment that we think is important to engage first is the trend centers. So these are, these are change agents. These are the innovators of climate actions. So they include the NGOs, climate scientists, climate communicators, researchers, activists, basically innovators of you know, climate-friendly technology and products. So they need to start the norm change in the first place. They need to signal their values and actions and create the conditions necessary for widespread adoption for climate action. Um, also, this group has to reach a tipping point for social movement. So in the literature, there's you know, anywhere from 20 to 25%, uh, that's a tipping point that you need to reach before you can mobilize the action for, with the majority. So that's, that's, that's sort of the first group. And then usually in, in, this, in, this, in the beginning of the social movement, um, there's resistance, but then policies eventually change because enough people are getting on board. 
Um, so systemic change would need to happen at the government level, obviously, but it has to co-occur with social movements that empower decision makers to take bold actions on climate change. So this could involve governments offering incentives for low carbon products and services, um, governments make, making climate friendly infrastructure the default instead of the alternative. Um, they can incentive, incentivize business to come up with affordable, convenient, attractive options that people will be naturally drawn to instead of asking people to, to use their morals and values and, 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 and personal sacrifices to act. So I think this, these are the kind of the, the this, uh, uh, settings we have to create uh, for collective behavior change to happen. Now, with that in place, we need to engage the majority of the public, which is the 50 and 60% of the population. So there, we need to identify the most effective actions for people to take. And these actions include private actions, like flying less, driving less, eating less meat, for instance, uh, and social signaling actions, like signing petitions, maybe uh, sharing certain information on climate change and, 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 and initiatives, as well as system changing actions. So things, civic actions like voting, talking to your local politicians on, on climate initiatives and, and actions, for instance. So this is what behavioral scientists can do is to, you know, to disclose this, this kind of action toolkit to the public. And communicators uh, would need to bridge that knowledge gap with the public and convey the findings from behavior science to the public effectively. Now we have the last stubborn group who are the laggards. Uh, so they involve climate skeptics and deniers. I think that's the most difficult group to engage on, uh, on climate change, um, but there are solutions. One is we can use a trusted messenger uh, who's typically their in-group role model to deliver the message. We can use their trusted peer uh, to convey information on what they need to do and how they can uh, take those actions. So I think this social diffusion approach is what we, what we recommend uh, as a result of the roundtable discussion. Thank you very much. And I mean, feeding off that, uh, Wolfgang, in a way, that was, um, what do you think are the most effective ways to communicate climate science and counter misinformation? that perpetuates disbelief, skepticism, and inactions. I think Professor Zhao mentioned a really important point, which is the segmentation, to not think of the public as, as a, a, a monolith. And it, that is especially true when it comes to uh, climate science. We know about various segmentation models, the, the six Americas of Yale, five Australias of Monash University. And I would start with not assuming any pre-existing basic knowledge, that is one thing, not just refer to the Paris Agreement or to the 1.5 degree goal, which becomes even more absurd in the US where we measure temperature in Fahrenheit and it, it loses even that context, but to keep explaining. Um, and then the second bit is to not overemphasize accidentally the concerns of that minority of climate science deniers, but to focus on the majority by now in most countries, thankfully, of populations that acknowledge climate science, but now need to be moved or at least informed about what the next steps are to address this urgency proportionately. So going back to your question, Arend, uh, establishing basic knowledge, which is what I'm trying also to do within news organizations where you face a similar challenge. And second, not addressing the public as a whole, but in a segmented and targeted manner as much as any possible. And then also to translate current climate science from these 2030, 2050 narratives into um, the more immediate time ahead of us into yearly goals, the next two years, the next three years, and to translate the so-called climate story into what I experience locally. Thank you very much. And that's the perfect segue in a way to hand over to Tamsin and the inequalities roundtable. We have a group discussion. Um, very shortly, hopefully, as well. Aaron, um, so as we've discussed a few times now, the other round table was on inequalities. And here we're obviously looking at geopolitical, but we had a big focus, particularly on structural. There's a, a lot of crossover with the other round table. In fact, it'd be interesting to dig into that later. We invited uh, participants from six countries across the uh, so-called global North and South. 
Um, and we asked them to think through and talk through how inequalities affect who is impacted by the two crises and how they're impacted, how the crises have exposed inequalities and what we need to understand about inequality in order to find effective solutions and progress. For this theme, it was obviously particularly crucial to gather a richly representative group of people, not only in terms of race and gender and other criteria, but to fulfil our core aim of allowing people to meet and talk who might otherwise not meet at a conference or read the same publications. Um, to get together, we had medical doctors with scholars of race and gender, climate change mitigation experts, a chief executive and a town mayor getting together in a space that otherwise didn't exist. The resulting conversation was inspiring, sometimes quite difficult. However, some incredible common themes started to emerge and some questions asked developing around how crises are not accidental, are they? Tools are not neutral. Uh, is there a third crisis of values? Um, and questions around who gets to construct knowledge? How do we use it? Um, and again, I'm sure there will be many crossovers with the behavioral group as well. But on that note, I will ask our round table chairs, Gerald and Helen, to turn their cameras on at this point so that I can introduce them. So um, our chairs then were Gerald Torres, who is a professor of environmental justice at the Yale School of the Environment, with a secondary appointment as professor of law at the, uh, at the law school. Previously, he served at the president of the Association of American Law Schools and as a deputy assistant attorney general for the Environment and Natural Resources Division of the US Department of Justice. His work intersects the environment, agriculture and food systems and social justice. Dr. Helen Bond is an associate professor in the School of Education at Howard University in Washington, DC. She is a Fulbright Nehru Scholar to India, liaison to the Centre for African Studies and a founding member of the Centre for Women, Gender and Global Leadership at Howard University. She is also the former director of the Centre for Excellence in Teaching, Learning and Assessment. Dr. Bond holds a PhD in Human Development and co-chairs SDSN USA, along with a special working group on sustainability and justice. She served as a research fellow at the George Eckhart Institute for International Textbook Research in Braunschweig, Germany. With a deep commitment to human rights, she has served as West Virginia Human Rights Commissioner, confirmed by the State Senate, and as a Holocaust Institute for Teacher Education Fellow with the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. She has lectured in over 20 countries and was inducted in the 2020 Alumni Hall of Fame by the Ohio State University Mansfield for her work in education and human development. Thank you to both of our chairs. Um, so I'll ask you both first if you could speak a little on what the round table um, gave to you um, and how you think the COVID-19 crisis and the climate crisis similarly or dissimilarly affects existing global inequalities. Well, I'll get started. Uh, we really did have a fantastic group of people coming together and I was rereading some of their comments. I decided to address this question by looking at three major categories or, or buckets that you might consider uh, of the comments. And one across theme was this notion of this, what I'm calling the tyranny of small things. We had panelists that discussed because Ebola was so impactful and so scary in West, and West African parts of Africa that people really recognized that small things can actually kill you. And so that gave them a higher acceptance of public health measures, but that was in contrast to what some considered also as human rights failings and some political failings. But there was a quite high uh, acceptance of, of public health and, and hygiene practices, which they felt really had improved. So that's the, the first major concept, the, what I'm calling the tyranny of small things. The second was actually a quote from one of our um, a roundtable uh, panelists, uh, never waste a good crisis. And we had people talk about this notion of what they learned from HIV in that particular time period in that particular part of the country, the importance of acting very quickly, uh, the importance of messaging and, and good, com good communication overlap a little bit there with our behavior group and felt that some of the lessons from HIV had actually informed their work in terms of COVID-19, and they also feel that it can inform climate change as well. 
The third bucket, and then I'll stop and let my uh, distinguished colleague take off from there. And I'm sure we'll talk a lot more about this. And that is the cumulative nature uh, or impact of, of inequalities. And you know how an inequality in one area, inequality in terms of COVID, groups that are vulnerable in COVID-19, groups that were vulnerable in HIV, are also groups that are going to be disproportionately uh, vulnerable uh, in the climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Th thank you Helen. Um, one of the, the things that was most apparent in the discussion uh, in the round table we had um, in discussing the relative roles of uh, government, uh, the uh, civil society, private business, academia, et cetera, was by focusing on the responses that uh, the COVID crisis generated. Uh, and as the earlier uh, uh, discussion suggested, the uh, immediacy of the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic produced uh, a couple of things. One, it galvanized action. Uh, it, cre it, it, it highlighted the complications of politicizing knowledge. Uh, uh, and it led to the conclusion that we needed to act what the particular action would be, of course, was a subject of a lot of, uh, of debate and continues to be, but we needed to act to alleviate um, potentially catastroph catastrophic uh, consequences, shutting down the economy, the economy imploding, uh, institutions no longer being able uh, to, to function, the main uh, import of particular uh, civil uh, society institutions being uh, sidetracked. The, the uh, need to act because it uh, emerged from the immediate impact of COVID in some ways revealed to us a couple of things. And the discussion uh, uh, was particularly strong in this area. It, it um, highlighted the way in which the potential catastrophe represented by uh, climate is still in many quarters uh, across those various institutions viewed as a, a crisis that we have the opportunity to uh, uh, address rather than experience it as a crisis that is currently happening. So the, uh, the uh, different institutions uh, take the, the temporal dimension of the crisis and what that temporal dimension of the crisis reflected was a, um, uh, the sense of urgency to come to particular policy judgments or particular actions that would directly address uh, the, the, the crisis. So I think that was the first major takeaway, which is that the, the temporal dimension of any particular crisis will have policy implications uh, because if people feel as if there is a potentially catastrophic crisis, but it hasn't yet occurred, then the feeling that we have the opportunity to, uh, to act at a rather more leisurely Pace uh, will dominate the discussion. Uh, one of the things that the, the panelists um, talked about was the, the need to translate the kind of emergency or the kind of the sense that, that there is a need for uh, uh, action today uh, was what was critical. So, Let's look at the, the, the various institutions, government, civil society, private business, academia. The other thing that the, the panelists highlighted is that the imperatives of each one of those uh, sectors are different. So how you produce action in each area is going to represent a, a different set of criteria, but they were clear to recognize that, that action in one sector is necessarily going to produce reactions or potential for action in other areas. 
So one of the things that we needed to, to, to study was, was how did action in one sector move other sectors consistent with its own imperatives to, to act. Uh, as we face uh, the, the, the climate crisis, academia has a special role to play in the, to this extent. And it's uh, been uh, in some ways uh, catalyzed by the, the COVID-19 uh, um, crisis. What it led to was a, 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 an impressive cross-disciplinary uh, effort to basically bring what the various uh, 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 disciplinary perspectives have to bear on the solution to the problem. So you have public health speaking to uh, the hard sciences, speaking to the social sciences, even speaking to, uh, to the humanities. And each of those different sectors had a role to play. And the, the immediacy of the crisis generated incentive for cross-disciplinary work uh, to occur. And uh, in some ways got us out of the silos that we typically uh, in, inhabit. Similarly, the, the, the cross-disciplinary nature that was reflected in academia was also reflected in cross-scalar activities in uh, governmental act action. So you had action at the federal level, action at the state level, action at the local level, and there had to be uh, coordination. And that need for coordination uh, was, uh, uh, I, I think, apparent. It was acted on, but it also was a source, of, and people noted this, of political dissension. So uh, the, the questions of the distribution of power were uh, were never far from uh, never far from from the, the the concern. Civil society and all the intermediate institutions, those institutions that stand between the individual and the state, have their own particular roles to play, and they're going to be different. Now, private industry, uh, in the context of both COVID and climate, recognize that solutions are going to be necessary for their well-being. They're of course going to differ depending upon which uh, particular industry, but but I think the main takeaway was th that the crisis produced uh, um, conversations across sectors, across disciplines, across scales, and that's uh, uh, something that we can take to the uh, and need to take to the discussion of climate. I'll stop there. Thanks very much, Gerald. I'm aware that there was so much more in our round table that we could keep talking about. So I will ask both of you to hold your next set of thoughts for the panel discussion, if that's OK. Um, we'll move on now then to invite all of our panelists to turn their cameras back on, including our keynote speaker, Magdalena, um, and uh, see if we can get a discussion going across the two round tables at this point. So the first question I'll put to you then is that one topic often discussed was the distinction between different audiences, their role in disseminating information and the magnitude of their impact. What are the different audiences and what audiences have the biggest impact potential? Please just jump in whenever you have a thought. Well, if I, I, I hate to... I, I, I will I will try not to talk any more than, uh, than is necessary. But but one of the things that in the earlier discussion that I thought was was uh, incredibly important and it was actually raised in our panel uh, as well, uh, which is the the the, the differently segmented seg segmented publics uh, and recognizing the differently segmented publics uh, uh, and and coming to terms with what flows from that observation it, it is incredible. I, I would like uh, for uh, Dr. Sada to talk about the, the social diffusion. And, and one, of the, um, one of the things that, that uh, is important to me, right? It, it, and I think it was important on the panel too, was figuring out the way um, ideas, both malign and, 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 and positive uh, uh, flow through uh, the, the, the society, uh, because that was highlighted in our panel. Uh, we, you, know, you have good information and bad information, and it just seems like both horses are right at full speed. <laughs> yeah. 
and, and how do we approach that? So I, that's a question I, I guess I'd address the, the, the uh, uh, reporters from the other panel and maybe Helen wants to, to weigh in as well. I mean, I, yeah, I think to me, the, the, uh, the most important segment, there are different ways to define that, but the change agents, the trendsetters are the most important first. And then we can diffuse their actions, uh, their messages across to the early adopters, early majority. Um, there are different ways of diffusion. Um, I think, again, depending on your motivation, some people are, are, are they can't wait to jump on board. Uh, so for the keeners, I think it's easy for them to adopt the action as long as it's, it's affordable, it's accessible, um, it's realistic for them, for instance. Whereas for the more hesitant population, where well, that's the, the lay majority segment, they probably need more convincing. Uh, they will wait to see what happens to other people, and they eventually want to do what other people are just doing. So that's the herd, herd mentality uh, of this group. So I think um, we, we, we need to kind of reach the, the first the first movers, but then the greatest impact comes from, comes from the majority. Like that's when the majority of the public actually acted, um, but they have to act on the conditions that, you know, the actions are available, affordable, easy, attractive, et cetera. So here, that's just my thoughts. And over to Helen. Yeah, I'd like to talk a little bit about trusted messengers. That was a really a, uh, a theme in our particular uh, session. The use of people that communities trust uh, and uh, have confidence in to really carry the, these messages. And I know in Af the African-American community, there was a major trust issue. And one of our panelists talked about in the HIV uh, as well as in uh, the COVID, they use pastors and, and people of, uh, of the faith. And a good example though, to really look at the population that you're working with and consider their culture. I'm a big component of culture, of centering culture in whatever solutions, you know, that, that you approach. For example, you know, in Nigeria, this notion we have in the States, Hollywood, in Nigeria, you have Nollywood, creates over 20 billion jobs a year. And so uh, the UN actually used a Nollywood, a Nigerian actress, Toyan Abraham, as a UN messenger about hygiene you know, and about COVID-19. So, you know, one thing that, that I, I didn't get to say the first time around that I actually meant to say is really thinking about the culture and centering culture in all the decisions and policies, you know, uh, uh, that, that uh, uh, you know, in terms of audiences and communication and information. Raise my hand. I'm not sure if yes. I Magdalena, I please go ahead and and uh, and speak. So um, I have a sort of a comment and a question to the panel, actually, um, since you know I, I am here a, a non-expert uh, amongst experts. Um, first of all, a, a comment. So far, what we've been discussing is um, communicating and influencing from the decision makers and from the policy makers to the general society and the general public. I guess if we can discuss the same, but in the other direction. And so here I want to connect with something that Gerald, Gerald said about um, how COVID-19 and the climate crisis, of course, unfolded different timescales very clearly something I alluded to as well. And how the difficulty that we have certainly in the global north is that we don't feel tangible effects necessarily of the climate crisis. Well, that's just for us in the global north. If I was today speaking from a, an island uh, state or if I was a, a crop farmer, then my perspective would be very different and my sense of urgency would be very different. And so the reason why I'm saying this in particular is because just earlier today, I saw an incredibly powerful tweet, hashtag COP26, 
from a farmer from Nigeria who was standing in front, in front of his field where he had stunted crop in his field, all as a result of um, anomal anomalous weather, uh, complaining about the fact that he was not represented at the COP. So based on your experience and your knowledge, how can we empower, I guess, people to communicate and reprioritize for the policymakers and, and the governments? We've had a raised hand from Wolfgang, but um, I mean, you could probably also come in on that or does somebody else want to volunteer? If, if, if the question was, how do we influence the policymaker? There's two things. One, one two, uh, you know, Magdalena's point is, 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 is incredibly important, right? Because, uh, you know, climate change is not a problem that's going to happen. It's a problem that's happening, right? And, 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 and being able to, to communicate that clearly, even in the global north, or maybe especially in the global north, is, is uh, yeah, uh, important. You know, in the work I do on, on social movements, one of the, the things that uh, is critical right, is, uh, is understanding what the capacities are both for social movements to produce the impetus for legal change uh, and cultural change uh, 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 that can be durable. Now, um, where you have uh, working democratic process, uh, uh, that's the first qualification. We can, we can, that could take the rest of the day talking about that. But where you have working democratic processes, figuring out a, a how to access those processes in a way that reflect the voices that the social movements are producing is the critical step. So, I mean, as, as you know, the joke that people like to make up here is, is, you know, politicians may not know many things, but they know how to count. Right, uh, and we need to we need to reinforce their necessity of counting, um, and that's why the environmental movement, the climate change movement, uh, has got to be a movement, right, and not just a, uh, a political interest, and that's the, the 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 critical that's that's the direction we have to go, it seems to me. And I'd just like to say very quickly, including. You know, one really impactful thing someone said in our group is that, you know, we're speaking from a very narrow experience. We're academics, we're authors, and we don't necessarily, you know, uh, it doesn't necessarily trickle down and, and include the voices of, of, of for example, the, the Nigerian farmer. You know, I had a discussion with a, an African climate change activist, and she said, you know, what we don't hear about is that there are Three glaciated, three glaciers, three mountain glaciers in, in Africa. Uh, you have, you know, Mount Kenya, you got Mount Renrari and Uganda, and of course the one we all know, Mount Kilimanjaro uh, in Tanzania. And all three will be deglaciated by 2040. And Mount Kenya is expected to be deglaciated a decade earlier than that. She says, you know, you we don't hear those those stories. You know, we hear about other places in the world, and maybe by including you know, uh, you know, we're a very academic, you know, uh, uh, panel, uh, but just including those voices early on um, um, and speaking to Gerald's reference to his social movements. A lot of times, thinking about the civil rights movement in the United States where, you know, you had what I call the civil rights men, you know, leading the way, Martin Luther King, and you didn't hear the voices of Fannie Lou Hamer. So I'll just let uh, some, some others, uh, Arend, if I may, I'd like to add a thought, that comparison between COVID and climate change. And that is that in, in so-called COVID communication of national health institutes, the media and governments, uh, there was a clear set of action. We all knew and know what we're expected to do as citizens. Hygiene, social distancing, getting vaccinated, wearing masks. Uh, working from home as long as that makes sense. There's very clear actions. It seems to me that when it comes to fighting climate, change, there is no comparable set of actions. And from journalism and journalism research, we know that one of the most sought after 
types of, of content of journalism are lists of what I can do as an individual. And they tend to perform really well in terms of audience metrics. But those lists are so terribly easy to shoot down through what about is and also real scientific evidence that puts them into question. So sometimes during our wonderful panel discussions, I wondered if we haven't reached a point where we know more about the behavioral science and how to move societies into action than we actually do about what those most important actions are at an individual level. Uh, and how to find that balance that Michael Mann and others have written about in their recent books that we shouldn't be in a juxtaposition of personal action versus regulatory and government action, but they need each other. But what is the most consequential personal behavioral change for which we need the social sciences to, to activate them? Yeah, that, that's an excellent point, Wolfgang. And I think that's a knowledge gap that behavioral scientists, social scientists, and communicator, journalists, communicators need to get out. But I think going back to the uh, inequality issue that Magdalena talked about, I think there's, again, another parallel between COVID and climate change. With COVID, the victims, people who have you know, passed away from COVID are primarily people from the lower socioeconomic status. The higher income individuals are, are better insulated and protected from COVID. And very much the same story goes with climate change. Uh, with the global north, our GHG emission capita is huge compared to the global south individual. And yet it's these island nations, these lower income countries or developing countries that are suffering the most severe consequences of climate change. Again, the global north are better protected against that. So how do, how do we abridge this, this inequality, this you know, injustice. Um, I think I want to draw one kind of behavioral science lesson from the Syrian war. I don't know if you remember, there was a new story about a Syrian boy that was washed on the beach. And the boy was dressed in you know, colorful clothes. And it was a very sad story that drew a tremendous international response to the Syrian war. I think that kind of messaging and communication needs to happen with climate victims and refugees. Uh, we're not hearing the stories from Kenya, from you know, most um, communities that are suffering from climate change consequences. We need to hear more about these individual stories that are vivid and make us think that this could happen here. This could be our child. Um, I think this is, this is, this is the, the connection that communication and journalism need to um, uh, work on or they need to draw informed by behavioral science insights. I want to say one thing that I didn't get to mention, and I, it would really be a mishap um, because our group really did focus on it, is drilling down on the impact of women and looking at it in different ways. You know, there's has been this discussion. First of all, there's, there's one out of every 300 African-American children are now orphans. Drill down even further, there's been this discussion around whether boom or bust because pregnancies and all that still carries on even in pandemics. And whereas in the United States, uh, it's a bit of a boom, you, you're seeing a drop in pregnancy, but in least developing countries, I mean, you're, you're seeing a boom, it's more of a bust in the US where pregnancy and uh, that has gone down over the pandemic. But then women have, because of the, pan, because of the pandemic and as well as climate change, they don't have access you know, to uh, those kind of health services. Uh, drilling down even more in another direction, uh, which I, it's very interesting and was mentioned in our round table, women that are career women and scientists, uh, their impact uh, in terms of mothering, their impact on their, their publication uh, and, their, and, and their careers. Uh, and so that's, um, that's an area of, uh, that really we need to be, I think, very, very mindful of. I was reading an article uh, just recently about uh, uh, someone was projecting that now because of the pandemic, people are more at home, they're working from home, that duties will be shared between the sexes. And I thought, well, that's, you're really kind of implying that, uh, that first, most people are married in the typical households and that one partner or both partners are able to, to stay at home. And we know that uh, in terms of inequalities, a lot of people that don't have access to education and other things tend to have uh, forward customer facing, people facing jobs that really lends them more to 
uh, to being more vulnerable. Thank you. One thing maybe to kind of move us on to another question, uh, which was also important in our discussion, which we had was, um, there's this kind of tension between facts and creating a narrative to motivate on climate change. So how can we find those strategies and how do we find ways uh, uh, to define uncertainty when we uh, talk about science? So um, who wants to take that question <laughs> right now? Maybe to illustrate yeah. the question more and how it came up in our panel, which is that um, news organizations have learned a lot about how to report on conflicts, good conflicts between governments and their scientific advisors during COVID. And we have even seen different scientists uh, propose different vaccination strategies, for instance. But news organizations are still worried that as soon as they question a scientist, that that will be instrumentalized by science deniers. And that the basic understanding of how to work with scientists is lacking still in the public. Uh, that there's a difference between having two scientists argue with each other versus, for instance, having an outright COVID denier arguing with the scientists, that those are two totally different things, which you, of course, understand, um, but it's still something that news organizations are shying away from. So how do you, which both COVID and the climate crisis being ultimately science topics that need a much greater degree of, of basic scientific literacy in our populations and the news media, how do you also discuss doubt as a key feature of science? I mean, if, if the, I, 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 I'm not sure you want to lead with that formulation, uh, uh, but, what, what, but, but, but you do have to, to uh, um, it seems to me, explain uh, kind of the process of, I mean, I'm not sure how you do this, right? Because you have to explain the process of hypothesis creation, testing, et cetera, right? which implies, you know, uh, lack of certainty at the outset, right? Um, it, it seems to me that the, the, the anti, both in COVID and in, in cl climate, um, it, it's, it's not so much that there is distrust of the science, uh, it's that there's distrust of the institutions of power through which the science is communicated. And so the, the, the institutions that communicate the science are viewed as, as uh, having a specific political agenda and, and thus uh, illegitimate to some extent. And that's where, it, that's, that's where the, 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 uh, the disconnect is. So that's why the... the, uh, the uh, I think it was Helen that mentioned, right, and, and maybe Dr. Zhao mentioned the the question of culture. Actually, is you know remains a really critical, uh, uh, really critical uh, uh, part of this. So you know, I, I we mentioned it in in our panel briefly, but but it's you know the uh, I think we mentioned it in the context of, of uh, I can't even remember now. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say because I don't have my notes right in front of me. But, but, but when, I, when I suggested earlier that the humanities matter too, right? It's, 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 it's the, the question of how we get the narratives that will be effective in the general popular discussion, which can help lead to I don't know if you can re-legitimize something that's been delegitimized, but but I think part of the problem is that is that the, the the voices that are communicating the science have been delegitimized, and that's the tri crisis we're facing. I often wonder if um, some of the issues we're discussing now may not be solved or helped um, by greater transparency. So, for example. Um, this issue of trust in science um, or wavering trust in science brought upon changing position that scientists take vis-a-vis -a, -vis a specific question or specific issue 
to those who practice science, it's of course not surprising. We know science is not religion. It's not immutable. In the face of new facts being discovered, scientists change their position. Um, we, we have a slogan saying that uh, science progresses by self-correction, et cetera, et cetera. But somehow along the way, there has been this narrative that, that became created that science is immutable. And now all of a sudden, if it turns out that scientists need to change their position, this may lead to a conclusion, aha, well, maybe all along they had no idea what they were talking about. But of course, that is clearly not the case. So I wonder if this is in fact an opportunity for us, for example, to be much more transparent about the scientific method, how conclusions are arrived, that when conclusions are made, they're made in a context, they're always made in a context, and when that context changes, the conclusions may change, et cetera, et cetera. The other thing, um, another comment to what you just said, Gerald, um, sometimes, uh, lack of trust in science is associated with um, suspicion around how science is funded and enabled. So again, a greater transparency around that. So effectively a conflict of interest type of a transparency could help that matter further. I, I mean, I, I, I agree with you. I, I do, I do, um... The, the one caution, and um, Helen, you'll have to remind me if I if someone said this on, on our panel, I can't recall. Uh, um, trans, uh, 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 transparency is absolutely a value that ought to be um, prioritized uh, if we're going to try to generate um, in, increasing legitimacy for the, the voices that are conveyed the, conveying the information. But uh, as Wolfgang, or maybe it was uh, Arndt said, uh, uh, you know, the, the you know, communicating the uncertainty, which is part of the transparency, um, at, this, at this moment that we're in, right, is not necessarily helpful. Uh, but, I, but, 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 it, but it's essential to the, to the, to the to the 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 the, uh, the process, right? It's essential to the 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 way science works. It's the, essential to the way any scholarship works, which is you know you have a provisional uh, uh, hypothesis, uh, and you test it or you try to get evidence. Uh, um, you know, I think the you know being transparent is critical, but it runs the risk of say of of the you know. The, on the one hand, on the other hand, kind of argument, or the what aboutism kind of arguments, and you know, uh, um, you know, as I sit and watch in my own country, uh, um, I mean, we're we're deeply in the throes of that, uh, and 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 finding our way out of it is the is the challenge. Yeah, Gerald, I think it's important to clarify what scientific uncertainty means. Um, and it's also important to convey the scientific consensus, for instance, on climate change. It's that there are there is uncertainty, but we're not disagreeing with each other here. Right. right? So that, that's important to convey. Um, and I think the, in terms of the language of uncertainty, I think there, there are ways to kind of uh, improve that. Uh, because when the public hear uncertainty, they, they think we don't know what we're talking about. Or we, we don't, you know, we don't know enough. So they, I think we can maybe move away from certainty, uncertainty to something like these are the range of possibilities. Here are, here's the chance of each outcome from happening, for instance. So, so it's not, you know, maybe bypass the word uncertain, but just to say, you know, there are possibilities of different outcomes. Cornell University recently published this paper again, stating that when they sampled 11,000 papers on the human made causes of climate change and stated it's 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 a certain it's 99 percent certain um and journalism has amplified that as scientific certainty climate change is human made but that has maybe also set up a bit of a trap for ourselves because there are many other areas where we do not have that same degree of certainty 
And we're now also politically in the situation as I'm here in Glasgow where we need to make decisions over uh, uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation that have to have to be right for what they do over the course of the next decades, 30, 40, sometimes 50 years. And of course, that brings a much greater degree of uncertainty and, and downright speculation. And I agree with Magdalena that transparency is key, but it will, it will make scientists and science uh, more vulnerable again against what, what aboutism that will try to exploit that. If I could um, briefly jump in, there's one more question I wanted to ask before we move into the Q&A. Um, we're kind of getting into areas around the construction of knowledge, the trust around knowledge detractors. Um, and in our panel, um, a big theme that came up towards the end was the format in which we'd put this series together, who we'd pick to be involved, why we'd pick those people and who wasn't at the table and what that means for the construction of knowledge. Can I ask the panel just before we move to the audience, because the audience have been asking some questions around this as well. What limitations do we see in the construction of knowledge and how can we make sure all types of knowledge is captured to help us move forward in the climate crisis? I'd just like to say something real quickly. As we think about centering culture, the culture has a long memory. Uh, and in some communities, you know, they question what are the aims of science. And when you intersect that with the aims of science, with all the other economic and, and vulnerabilities they have, if you're not doing right by me in education, if you're not doing right by me in health, how can I trust that you're gonna do right by me in science? Whatever that is to, 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 to a group. So I, I think, that's been somewhat overcome and, and there's been a lot of talk about the Tuskegee, uh, history of the Tuskegee uh, experiment uh, with African-Americans, but now African-Americans really have a really good vaccination rate. So there are some lessons there. They were using trusted messengers in other ways. They've been able to, you know, even though culture has a long memory, they were able to sort of, you know, rise to that moment. I know Gerald had some comments. No, no, I was uh, not, not at all. I was, I, I unfortunately have to leave in a couple of minutes. So I apologize, um, mm -hmm. but it, it's an important, it's for important thing. I, I've got to go talk on environmental justice, so it's, it's actually uh, mm -hmm. uh, completely consistent. Um, but, but, uh, 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 Tamsin, I wonder if you would restate your question. Apologies. Um, yes, so the construction of knowledge, what, what limitations do current practices, and I suppose I'm here as a publisher as well, we play a part in this. Who's not at the table when it comes to the construction of knowledge and what role is that playing, particularly on structural inequalities uh, in, in stopping us moving forward in the climate crisis? <laughs> Sorry. I just thought I threw that in as your easy question, huh? <laughs> it was a big question in our session. I mean, if anybody has final <laughs> comments on that, please. Oh, I, I, let me let me just say that, that one thing that I use even in law, you know, and I recognize that you know, uh, uh, when I'm meeting the teaching in the in the in the in the law school or in the school of the environment, is I use literature because there's there there are stories being written, there's films being made uh, that that help you get to uh, uh, a position where you can then start to use you know, more objective uh, uh, techniques to explore the issues that are raised. But, but you know, in some ways, it's a kind of, uh, uh, that in some ways, you, what you have to reinforce, and I think the, you know, the, 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 the endeavor that you're undertaking is really critical here, that Springer's undertaking is really critical here, that in some ways, science is the democratic creation of knowledge. Right? It is the, the, the way in which knowledge, the way in which everyone contributes to the creation of knowledge. It's, it, 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 you, there's training obviously that's necessary for it, but it's not close to anyone who wants to investigate. That's the key. And, and, and you know, it's, it, 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 I think as long as it's viewed as you know, uh, eggheads telling you what you have to do, there are gonna be people who are gonna resist that, right? And, as, as opposed to, to to uh, uh, really uh, exploring how you know the 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 scientific method is a democratic 
process of knowledge creation. And that's, that's a critical insight that people forget. Uh, um, I mean, it, it, remember science was the, was the antidote to, 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 to uh, authoritarianism, right? Yeah. Yet still it moves, who can forget that? Right. Yeah, I but I, what good, good point, Jared. So, so I guess one way in in, in, term, in terms of communication or knowledge knowledge creation is we have to recognize that the information we present is not necessarily information people heard. Right. Science only applies in a given, given context under very specific conditions, and that's also why we're seeing sort of the replication crisis in social sciences because we're not able to re kind of recreate the results in a different in a, in a different population, et cetera. So I think we need to, again, take the cultural context into account when we communicate science. So we have to maybe you know, use a narrative or storytelling frame that's culturally appropriate. So the audience actually hears what we intend to express. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think uh, Wolfgang, storytelling, that's part of an important part of uh, work for journalism to frame things in a in a in a in a uh, proper way do you want to come in maybe on that yeah um a typical theme in my work with news organizations is at least in europe and the us little bit less so in asia is that climate reporters climate me that now for the first time they have a sufficient budget their chief editor supports them but the news desk editor who decides whether that story makes it into a prime time news slot or will be promoted on a main social media account is, is often the obstacle. When asked why, it is because they say that those, these stories don't work well. Uh, and there are many exceptions. I don't want to say that climate journalism doesn't perform well in audience metrics, but it often struggles. And when I then looked at the criteria by which news desk editors decide, you just see the influence that, that our psyche has in wanting to have stories with people, with persons, with events. And the criteria by, by, by which news organizations decide is, is it recent? Climate change is, is now, but it's always also there in the future. So you could write about it another time. And news organizations are people, personification and events over processes. And the climate crisis is primarily a process. Uh, and, and our psyche in how we're being told fairy tales as children, we really want stories and people and events more than abstract formulations about processes. And that is why I think culture, a point that, that Gerald made earlier, culture and the arts getting engaged is so crucial. Many scientists, I think, put a lot of energy into reaching out to the press. And I wish there are similar efforts to, to get in touch and collaborate with cultural institutions, with gaming platforms and others that convey stories of some sort. Thank you. And unfortunately, uh, Gerald had to move, but I kind of like to move us to some questions of the audience. And there's one which was actually the first one which came in, which we also discussed is um, the question, how do we cope with a humongous mental pressure from pandemic and climate change? And I really like that uh, question and wanted to uh, pose it. So thank you for answering it or for, uh, for, for, for putting it to us. So who wants to start on that? Maybe Jay-Z, you want to start from your side? Yeah, I'm trying to decode mental pressure. I take that as um, the pressure on people's mental health. That, that's one inter interpretation. Um, the other interpretation is uh, the pressure of, you know, to act, the urgency uh, to act to address both crises. Um, I think, you know, we see both from COVID and, and climate changes, we see eco-anxiety, we see anxiety of our, you know, immediate future. Um, I think the, 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 the toll that both crises place on the human mind has been tremendous. Um, but COVID, I, I think for COVID, the mental toll is expected to be short-lived. Once again, we expect to go back to normal and resume our lives as usual as soon as everybody uh, is immune. 
But with climate, I think the, the mental toll is persistent. It's going to be uh, even more devastating as, as, as the years come. So I think, how do, how do we cope with that? Um, I think with, with COVID, there are clear individual actions, as Wolfgang said, that we can take to make up to protect ourselves. But for climate, what are those actions? So again, I think we need to convey that there are actions you can take to, one, reduce your own environmental impact or climate impact. Two, is to call upon leaders and decision makers to change policies, to change you know, infrastructure, for instance. Um, so there are, I think, giving people the toolkit to act is going to help with, with such anxiety. Wolfgang, how do you deal with that? Because you really, uh, I mean, how do you deal with the mental health side of it? Because you really started um, discovering, kind of going quite deeply into that in when you kind of, in your work over the last year, especially. It is a question in, in journalism, there quite a lot is known about the mental stresses for war reporters. Um, very little about the mental health of journalists who cover the climate crisis full time. Um, what I have heard so far is, is the understanding that the, the, the stress is not so much from looking at negative scenarios for the future, but results more from the cognitive dissonance between what I'm seeing and what I think the rest of my newsroom is seeing or how much urgency they attribute to the topic. And I spoke to a couple in my interviews of this last year, to a couple of, of journalists who told me they were planning to leave that topic again because they found it unbearable to feel so alone. So that is, that is one of the early things we're seeing from research that um, Monash University has done where they compared, it's too long to describe as an experiment, but what they saw is that taking personal action, changing your diet, changing your travel behavior, insulating your home, all the many things you can do, that um, th that also serves as a coping mechanism and increases your ability to engage with potentially threatening information about the climate crisis itself. I'd like to add something, Arin, on that as well, especially from the point of, of an educator. I'm working on a piece now around disaster risk reduction education, enabling teachers to work with students around understanding risk and this notion of preparedness. You don't see this at all in that much in at least schools I know in, in the US. But I think that's an element that needs to be, and it can be you know, intertwined, interconnected with, with, with public health. To people, students, young people to understand this notion of disaster, preparedness, risk, how to properly uh, appropriate risk in their own lives, I think is really important. So I'll just end with that. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. Well, no, we know go ahead. There, there are just to, to your question of how to how to how to convey also this potentially very demoralizing information, not only how to work on it our, ourselves and with it um, from the so-called constructive journalism movement out of uh, Denmark or the solutions journalism movement out of the US. Um, we have studies that show that if journalism about the climate crisis contains references to, to what one can do individually or what is being done at a corporate or government level that audiences, readers, viewers, listeners are more willing to engage with that kind of journalism and also to return to that publication. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I was going to bring another great question, some very good ones. I don't know how much time we're going to have. It's another one for Professor Zhao, actually, but I think there's parallels between both groups. How do you go from the first adopters to the herd fast enough? I think this relates also, Helen, to our group's discussion around individual action versus structural issues as well. Anybody wants to start? Maybe Professor Zhao. Yeah, I think there's the current narrative of climate actions is that you have to sacrifice, you have to give up some things like give up meat to adopt a plant-based diet. That narrative is not gonna help the diffusion process. I think what we need to do is for the trendsetters uh, to come up with options or actions that people would be naturally drawn to anyway. 
So what are the you know plant-based food options that people would love? I mean, I, I think there are options out there, but but you know they're not the adoption rate is still pretty low for many reasons. Um, but I think we need to stop the the sort of this this tremendous trade-off between individual kind of well-being and the collective well-being. I know ultimately there's no such trade-off, but I think to get engage the the the, the majority, we need to we need to make sure that you know the the, the options that you put forward, the the infrastructure available, is going to work for the people. So that's I think that's the bottom line. Anybody want to add anything? And I mean, Anna Helen, does this relate to kind of more structural inequalities as well? Culture, who's at the table, kind of issues. Anybody else? Okay. Aaron. There's so much to think about. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> I don't know how we're going to stop. <laughs> yes, exactly. I mean, we. Mm -hmm. I mean, what mm -hmm. I can say is, I mean, we um, we definitely want to continue this discussion. We just we believe we started something really, really interesting. Um, we of course work towards this event, but we'll continue working together and 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 hope to get to something publishable as well and maybe continue with that. So definitely uh, for the audience, definitely stay in touch uh, with what is going on at SDSN or at uh, Springer Nature uh, on this. Have you heard about that? Um, there are still several unanswered questions open. Uh, some also about the stories about animals to communicate on which we partially uh, covered. Um, so for us, it's just the beginning of a journey and we very much hope to continue uh, this journey. Tamsin, do you want to add anything to that from your perspective? No, that's it. Perfect. I mean, there were lots of questions in the chat. I wish I could have sat, you know, answering every single one. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to our panelists. Thanks um, to our partners. Uh, and yeah, there is much more to come and we hope to stay in touch with you all. And good luck in Wolfgang in Glasgow. I don't think you mentioned that you are actually on site uh, to take some of these points into some of your conversations which you are going which you are going to have. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs>